All right, everybody, welcome to Science on Tap. We got a packed house. This is awesome. I'm really excited. I don't see a, maybe there's a couple seats. If anybody's standing up and want to sit down, can finagle their elbows over there. There's a chair right here. Um, what a turnout! We're really excited. Um, welcome to the second anniversary of Science on Tap. This is our. We've got two years in on this program. <laughs> There we go. Look at it. See? There you go. Take them out. That's what we like. Do we have any first time uh, visitors to Science on Tap? There's one, two, back there. Couple? All right. Wonderful. It really welcoming of new faces. I'm going to take two seconds and tell you a little bit about the program. Everybody else knows of the deal. Um, Science on Tap is an opportunity for scientists in the valley and, and as far away as Missoula. Hopefully, we keep it that local. Um, to talk about their work and about what they're doing um, and to have a chance to communicate their science in a real laid back and friendly atmosphere. So we're real relaxed at Science on Tap. We're going to have waitresses coming through and asking if anybody needs a beer, please speak up if you do. Um, science on Tap is also a fundraiser, so every pint we sell between 5 and 8 o'clock we get a dollar of the proceeds to split between the Flathead Lake Biological Station and the Flathead Lakers. So it's a really great deal. Um, fundraise responsibly, I think is the best way to put it. Um, we are, <laughs> they switched it up on you. Tricky. Uh, so we're really excited. Uh, two years in, I think this program's been a really, uh, I've had a, a blast running it with, with Hillary and I think it's been a really good thing for our organizations and I hope the brewery and I hope for you guys too. I hope it's a, uh, um, we're looking forward to, to two more years and then two more after that. So, um, tonight I think that uh, Roger Smith is going to come up and talk about the Flathead Lakers a little bit, and I'll talk about the bio station when he's done. Hello, My name's Sean Devlin. I'm sorry. Sean Devlin. <laughs> right off the bat, love questions. If we don't want to buy a beer, but we want to say here's another blackbird. Can we just hand that to the waitress too? Um, you can hand it to this guy right here. <laughs> Fast fingers. Fast fingers. Fast fingers, man. That's his name. <laughs> Not the first time he's been called that. So, um, anyway, we'll. we'll uh, thanks, Roger. We're stepping up. More about the Flathead Lakers. Thanks, Sean. I, I'm on board with the Flathead Lakers. Have been for a, a number of years. Uh, this is called Science on Tap. It isn't called Science on Advocacy or or Advocacy on Tap. And I suspect if it were, you wouldn't be here. But uh, nonetheless, the lake. The, first of all, I the biological station deserves every bit of support you can provide to them. And I have no question about it. I'm a vice president, former vice president, recent at a university, so I understand the role of research. But advocacy has an exceptionally important role too. Not only getting more support for research, but also getting more support for policy development that's based on that research. And that's what the Flathead Lakers have been doing for the last, since 1958. You'll have to calculate, that's close to 60 years, I believe. And, and whether it's protecting the North Fork of the Flathead, which they were very actively involved in, whether it's looking at the muscles issues now, which the Lakers worked hard with the legislature and legislators during this past session to get more action in the Flathead Valley to protect Flathead waters. That was an extremely important part of our past year. That continues in terms of the current unfunding by the government, the Montana State Government, of the Flathead Basin Commission and our continuing work to get support for the Basin Commission that will enable it to run its pilot project with the support of others. Uh, advocacy is not an easy task. We've got 1,500 members. We work very hard with limited talented staff, very capable of relying on the science and provided by the scientists who have spoke, spoken here and elsewhere. And if those of you who are not part of that 1,500 members, I encourage you to look at the website and join the Lakers. It, their news, newsletters and annual report help keep you informed and certainly Science on Tap is an important part of sharing that information. From a personal perspective, I would just say I now live on the lake, about 100 feet from Skidoo Bay. In August, as I was in my hot tub after a morning swim, I looked down beside the hot tub, and there is a cougar six feet away. That's not a normal activity, but it does reflect just a wonderful place this is and what we have to protect. So, 
Welcome to Science on Tap. I'm delighted you're here and do support the biological station in the lake. And I would just like to mention that we have these wonderful Flathead Audubon calendars for 2018. It's a phenology calendar. Um, so every day there's something about what's going on in nature in and around us. Um, they're $15 and I can take credit cards now and I can also, if anyone wants to become a Flathead Laker member tonight, I can take your credit card too. Thank you. So who doesn't need a new calendar? That, that's the question. <laughs> All right, so I, I think we're, we're all eager to get started. I'm going to, to hand the microphone over to our speaker tonight. First, I'd like to present a Flathead Lake map from the bio station as a token of appreciation. Um, that, that, yeah. You can do that with it, that's what my boys do. Um, that's nice. Uh, any, anyway, we... Take that with it, that's just a small, small token of our appreciation. So tonight we have we have Diane Boyd who's going to be speaking about wolves in the flathead. And essentially her talk title, I think, says a lot. I think there's a lot of meaning in, in what she what she has to present tonight. And I, um, without further ado, we'd like to present a, a wonderful uh, UM alum. And, and uh, we always need to point that out here at Science on Tap. Um, and, and, Let's let's have a warm round of uh, welcome for now. Thank you. Okay, how's that for volume? Good. Okay. So before we get started, how many of you have in the last year seen a wolf in Montana? A year. The last ten years. The last twenty years. 30 years ago, Wolf in Montana. Well, I was fortunate to come here with, study the first wolf almost 40 years ago, and that's kind of the story I'm gonna tell about how it started from then till now. So without further ado, we'll get going on the story. And you know what, you always hear about it's the, it's the journey and the destination. It really is these wolves. They, they've had a hard road to go, they're finally here to stay, they're rooted in deeply, and I'm really pleased. Before we get on to the recovery story, there's a few factors that I want to talk about that allows wolves to be so successful in their recovery. Now your way. There, it, probably the wolf story has been the most successful endangered species recovery that I can think of in, in North America. The reason is, number one, they're social carnivores, they're family based. Um, it's really important, they, they, they stick together, they defend their territories with their lives, and they're very social. Um, they're cooperative, obligatory hunters, which means they are obliged to cooperate to kill prey. So they can't, it's not like a mountain lion, they can live on its own and hold on an elk. Wolves are not that efficient or effective predators. On the average, they kill about 4 or 5% of the things that they start to chase. So they have to live as a pack. <coughs> they have to find other wolves to live as a pack. They can't live alone very long. Um, they're terrific dispersers, and we documented really long distance dispersers from Yellowstone, which I'll be talking about. So when you get one in an area, they'll go miles, hundreds and hundreds of miles, to try and find another wolf to start a pack. Uh, they're highly territorial. Like you said, they'll defend their territory to the death, just like you would defend your home if you had somebody intruder come in and threaten you. They have high fecundity, which means they can breed like rabbits if the conditions are right ecologically. They recover quickly if you put a lot of pressure on them. Um, the two most important things for them is they're very highly adaptable, kind of like a coyote in many ways, and they're habitat generalists. So wolves can live anywhere. And historically, worldwide distribution, wolves have the most widely distributed population in the world except for homo sapiens. Wolves live in the Arctic, they live in Saudi Arabia, they live in dense forests, they live in deserts, they live, they live anywhere as long as they have the food requirement. So they're, they're kind of a prime candidate for recovery. They, they do quite well. Whoops. So um, wolves were distributed throughout North America from Canada all the way down into Mexico. Um, but due to uh, strong paradigms to kill off, remove the wolves from the landscape, 
Uh, so land feet could be settled and the Native Americans could be removed. Um, there was extensive poisoning, trapping, shooting, and removal of wolves. And by about the 1930s, 98% of the wolves had been, uh, been wiped out. So they were pretty much reduced to a tiny little population in Minnesota and a few in UP of Michigan. So basically by about the 50s, there were a few loners left. We had occasional loners here in Montana that would be seen. I think one shot Big Fork in the 70s. But they'd come down, look for others, get killed. Every time one came down, it would be killed. Um, finally, the passage of the Endangered Species Act in 1973 afforded them protection. That's about the same time Bob Ream, how many of you in here know Bob Ream? Yeah, he's a pretty amazing man. He just passed away, sadly enough, you know, this year. Um, anyway, he started the Wolf Ecology Project through the University of Montana and ran many, many students. I'm seeing heads nod, so there's some people in here who've been through that. Uh, students, volunteers, technicians, work study kids, all looking for wolves starting about 1970, all over the state of Montana. Any report he got, he'd send people to go look and see if they could verify wolves. The first wolf that we really were able to track uh, showed up in the North Fork of the Flathead, just north of the Canadian border in about 19, late 1978, 1979, and we named her Kishnina. Kishnina tiptoed south from Canada. She showed up in the very northwest corner of Glacier Park. She was alone. There were no wolves with her. Nobody knew she was there, and there was no fanfare. And that's why she made it. It's not like Yellowstone. <laughs> because nobody knew she was there, she was able to survive. So a very young Bruce McClellan, circa 1979, and Joe Smith with Kishnina. They just captured her April 4th, 1979, and we put a radio collar on her. And it was just north of Glacier Park, 70 miles. She was the first wolf that was able to stay in Montana in half a century and survive. And we followed her movements around and started my master's program, was following her and looking at comparisons with coyotes and food habits. Um, and then, lo and behold, a couple of years later, a three-toed black male wolf showed up in the flathead. And he'd obviously been in somebody's trap, but he survived it. And they met, and they bred, and they produced a litter just north of Glacier Park again. And there were seven pups. Unfortunately, the male was killed in June, and so Kishnina had these seven pups, half of them were gray, half of them were black. And I just thought, my God, there's no way she's going to be able to raise those pups by herself. And that middle of that winter, we were still seeing eight wolves traveling together. So she did it on her own. Very resourceful animal. <laughs> the big point that I like to emphasize is that these wolves in northwest Montana arrived here by walking here. They did not get dropped out of airplanes, helicopters, FedEx trucks. They walked down from Canada. They are not 175 pounds with 8K19. They are native wolves. And you know, I still run into people in my job that tell me about how these wolves were put here. They were not, and I know that for a fact. So we spent many years following these wolves on skis and snowshoes. In the winter and the summer, we would uh, trap to radio collar them. So they dispersed from Alberta and British Columbia. In 1986, one of them, not Kishina, she was gone by this time, uh, old, a white wolf named Phyllis Den in Glacier National Park. And this is the actual den. I've been into it. Um, and we were so excited. It was the first wolf den recorded known to be in Glacier Park in more than 50 years. It was pretty exciting. And for that matter, the first wolf den in the western United States in 50 years. Bob Green named the pack the Magic Pack because it was kind of magic that they were able to survive and showed up and, and were making it mostly in Glacier Park and up into Canada. There's 11 wolves in that photo. This is a picture of me a couple of years ago. No, actually. <laughs> Let's say uh, 1986 with Mike Fairchild. And Mike and I co-led this wolf project together for many years. He eventually moved on to the NRC and shortly after that, not too long, unfortunately had a heart attack and, and died at a young age. But we're collaring this wolf and taking a blood sample. This is 1986. This wolf had all the comforts of Glacier Park and protection. What did she do? 
A year later, she dispersed to the Yap. Maybe not the best choice, but she was looking for other wolves and she remained over there for quite some time and then disappeared. So when we captured these wolves in the summertime, we put radio collars on them, we took blood samples. We eventually ended up from a PhD running genetic samples for all the wolves that were native. In addition, all the wolves that were introduced from Yellowstone and Central Idaho, I had subsamples from every one of those original founders. And I did the work to the University of Montana, genetics lab with uh, Fred Elmer. Um, in the wintertime, we would go on skis and snowmobile and snowshoes, and we would track the wolves, we would cut their tracks, and we would go backwards on their tracks. We did not go the direction of travel because we didn't want any disturbance of their natural behavior. We didn't want to alter how they would, how they would behave in the wild. So we visited kills. Here's Bob and Mike on a kill. Bob goofing around there, chewing on a rib. Just that's Bob. <laughs> anyway, this is up in British Columbia, and it was the first wolf kill that he had seen in the Rockies, and he got all teary-eyed about it. It was pretty cool. And I have to say, over the years, we've had dozens, scores. I can't even keep track how many volunteers contribute to this program and have gone on to do amazing things and careers and really great naming up to uh, wolf recovery program efforts. So then with all this great wolf stuff going on naturally about that time, it turns out that there were plans and works to uh, reintroduce wolves into Idaho and, uh, and Yellowstone. I'm going to try to see if I can find the pointer here. It doesn't work on the screen. Well, I'm tall. Um, so the, the top part, Northwest, oh, works on a ski, wow, no more beer for her, actually didn't have any, but anyway, uh, Northwest Montana was rated as, uh, classified as fully endangered, so any wolves that were in Northwest Montana outside of the blue line were fully endangered, the proposed introductions into central Idaho, the Yellowstone, would not have been fully endangered. They were proposed as a, as a reintroduced species would be, be non-essential experimental. And this allowed for more flexible management, meaning if they got causing livestock problems, the federal government would go and kill them. Up in northwest Montana, they were protected, and those early wolves that got into livestock were translocated and moved and translocated and moved. And as we know from bears, is wolves both moving an animal is not a solution. And they usually end up dead anyway. So all this was ongoing. Congress is really excited about the reintroduction. This was most of America. But Bob and I were not in favor of reintroduction. We had kind of a minority voice, but some of the reasons were that wolves were already apparently dispersing to Yellowstone Park. Um, there were two wolves that showed up in Yellowstone in uh, the early 1990s. One was filmed in Hayden Valley sharing a bison carcass with grizzly bears and wolves by a professional cinematographer. It was an astounding feat that he happened to catch this wolf on film. I know the guy personally. And he saw it right at dusk one evening and it was too dark to film. He went home and he came back at 4 a.m. He went back out and the wolf was still there. The other one was a wolf that was shot um, south of Yellowstone Park in Fox Creek. And that wolf, was genetics were done on it. It was most closely related to wolves in the Nine Mile in Missoula. So wolves were getting there on their own. Bob and I thought, you know, for many reasons, we would like to see them walk down there. The biggest reason is those wolves that tiptoe down on their own, they basically run a gauntlet of obstacles and social intolerance and livestock and pets. And if they can run that gauntlet and make it, they had, the ones that have the bad behaviors never make it. And they'll shoot, shovel, and shut up. So those wolves that walk on their own are better adapted and better socially tolerated. You know, when wolves first started showing up here, the public was, yeah, it's okay, it's kind of interesting, and worse is the federal government dumped them out on us. Um, let's see. And it, the biggest question was it was just a matter of time. <clears throat> is this going to happen in a year, in 50 years? So the advantage of the reintroduction is that it would speed that process up significantly. So. Now that it's happened and they're everywhere, I'm grateful it did happen. But um, there was two kinds of releases done in the Yellowstone in Idaho. There was a total of 66 wolves released in the middle 1990s over two winters. Um, in Yellowstone, 
They were held in pens, in family groups, as wolves were captured as a whole pack. They were held in pens for two months during the breeding season and released just prior to denning season with the thought that the female would be about to give birth. She wouldn't be able to go very far. They would stick together and den. And it worked beautifully as planned. Rose Creek Pack, many, many packs. In Idaho, they took wolves that they caught as adolescent, two-year-olds or so, that were single, not family related, and they basically took them in crates in the back of the rider rental trucks, drove to the edge of the Idaho wilderness and kicked them all off. Just boom, fun. So they want them dispersed like dandelion fuzz in the wind, find each other, and set up their own families. And that's exactly what happened. Pretty exciting. The bottom line was it was an overwhelming success, way beyond, the population grew way beyond what was predicted in the models. And um, yeah, it was pretty impressive how that happened. Uh, some public intolerance, but pretty much most of the public was pretty wildly excited about it. The federal population um, delisting requirements were 100, uh, excuse me, 300 animals roughly, 30 breeding pairs or packs distributed over Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana for three consecutive years. Well, considering that this happened, the introductions from 95 to 97, the wolves met that requirement already in 2002. That's astounding to me. And the wolves were actually delisted in 2011 in Montana, uh, Idaho, Wyoming, not Wyoming, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. Wyoming didn't want to play, so the wolf management plan was not enough protection for the species, and they were just basically kind of listed as varmints. So Wyoming wasn't allowed to delist until much more recently. But here in Montana, we've been delisted for, gosh, six years now. We've got some interesting survey techniques. In the good old days, 30 years ago, we'd sent our field techs out in the field. We had no GPS units. We had no two-way radios. We sent them out. They would wade the North Fork of the Flathead in the middle of winter, cut ski tracks, follow the wolf tracks, find their way home at night, and show up at home. And I told them, you know, just kind of be really careful, and if you have any problems, here, you take this radio color in your backpack, if you have a problem, you pull the magnet off and you turn it on, we'll come find you. <laughs> <laughs> We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> so now we do snow tracking, um, we do howling surveys. Uh, I'm really into citizen science. I mean, I pretty heavily know my job with fish, wildlife, and parks and reports from people out seeing wolves, as well as hunters, as well as biologists, hikers, anybody. We look at harvest trends every year to see what the population is doing as an indicator of how the population is holding up. We have some pretty high-tech GPS collars right now, and they're, they're really amazing at what they can do. I just wish that they worked as well as they're promised to work. They don't tend to run very long. <coughs> We're developing a POM, which is a patch occupancy model, which I'll go into another slide. We're doing some great DNA work. And you can kind of, you can tell basically when a wolf shows up uh, with a little bit of accuracy where it has come from. Doing a lot of camera tracking. How many of you have trail cameras and have done play with them? It is like the world's coolest tool. You put the camera up, a month later you check it, it's like, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And you open up your car and you see what you got. I love it. Um, we, and I just took a drone course, and I hope to incorporate some drone viewers the next summer into this. quietly surveying a wolf on either side or down to a height, and zoom down with the camera to get counts so we don't have to disturb the animals. And we also have some pretty amazing opportunities. Uh, Tim Alley flies a lot with Two Bear Air, but they have the most remarkable system of all with aerial, combining aerial telemetry and helicopters infrared cameras and video cameras. Here's an example of that. Here's wolves. Okay, dense, dense. Well, look for the heat, the heat signal, the white animals, and then they switch to regular video, and, and they go along. There's going to be a couple more wolves coming. The third one after these two is wearing the radio colors. Look for the banner on the neck. There it is, a little silver spot. 
This is a long ways away from these wolves. It's in dense old growth forest up at Kippa Lake. And you can see the heat signals. I would never have seen those wolves without this infrared camera. I would never have known they were there except for a signal here. So it's a great tool. There were only five. One split off and went down this trail. The other four went the other way. It was really interesting because the uh, Jim Bob running the camera said he called total county saw was four, and I said, aha. The fifth one went separate. <laughs> so it's pretty neat stuff. The other thing I really, I'm gonna have to run to my computer here and turn this on. I'm gonna do it from there. Just uh, I'll have to, I'll just hang on. <laughs> Next day, come check it, and there'd be a scat on the road next to it. And the next day, check it, and it'd be dragged out of the hole of the chain and not sprung. And I'm like, what? So if you look at this female, and she's rolling over. I don't know if you can see her earlier, but she's an alpha female. She's a breeder. She's got nipples. She's nurse pups also, you know, the last couple of weeks. She's the smartest wolf in the pack, and the most critical animal is the alpha female. And I had a little piece of bait on a stick on the road there. And she just couldn't get enough of it. She wouldn't. She wouldn't mess with it when it was behind where the trap was. No. But she came along and just you know, kind of was waving at the, the single bird, telling me that she's, she's smarter than me and she always will be. Never did catch her. So I took a little piece of wood, a stick, and I dipped it in my secret little lure and put a rock on it. So she went over and she moved the rock over and then picks up the stick and she's playing with it. Rolling on it. Doing the cha-cha on my board. So Sean, if you're there, can you hit this one? Sure. You get it to play. Sorry, thanks. The other thing, so that was fun to see, but I learned what the wolves were doing. But we surveyed pup counts with the camera. So these wolf pups are just eight weeks old. And you see a fourth one come out. Yeah, because it's June 15th, they're going about April 15th. So yeah, so we know there's four. And I think even the coldest part of the whole person were kind of going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so we get some counts on where they're at and where the rotting sits are and how many are born. And we don't have to disturb them. We put the camera up, come back in two months, which is really nice. This is a map of our wolf distribution um, from December 31st last year, every year we tally up how many wolves we have, end of the calendar year. Each one of those circles is a centroid. It's not the path territory, it's just a center of locations. So if you had the actual size of the home range, they would all be touched, it would fill them out. I mean, we basically are full of wolves here. There's been wolves everywhere. What's that? Why are they so good some neighborhood? Seems like it was more sparsely populated in the neighborhood. Uh, down around Yellowstone. We got lots of, I don't know. I don't work down there. I don't work down there. I work in the northwest of town. But we had wolves here for a long, long time. Longer than the world. And they've saturated the country. So this is kind of a summary of where we were at last year, at the year's end. Uh, the number of wolves, minimum. Now I have to tell you, this is a minimum count that we can document. My math. It's, it's likely maybe half of what's actually out there, something like that. But 477 individual wolves. Now the federal requirement is 150. We have 477 minimum, probably twice so much, just in Northwest Montana. So we can, we've got the whole state's quota built here. Uh, number packed, 109. Requirement for the state, 
federally mandated regulated quota is 15 packs. We had 109 packs in the state. Um, that's for the whole state. Sorry, not Northwest Montana. The number of breeding pairs is 50. For, I mean, it's amazing, just 15. Um, number of wolves harvested, this one blew my mind. For the whole state of Montana, there were 255 wolves legally harvested between trapping and shooting. Now that's those that are checked. There are more that are going to get away or imported or whatever. I, I think back in the days when we had 25 wolves in the whole state and every animal, every animal counted, every mortality was very significant. Now we have 255 killed annually. That's just astounding to me. Um, the number of livestock confirmed killed last year was 57. The number um, of wolves that were killed by Wildlife Services, which is a federal agency that does livestock depredation control, and then private landowners for livestock reasons is another 61. So there's what, 310, almost 320 wolves. The amount of the livestock loss board paid out last year was almost $60,000 for livestock losses. So that's a little bit of the, the stats. I'm going to talk a little bit about pet occupancy modeling and I'm going to talk very little about it because I am not a statistician or just a regression smarty pants. I'm just a biologist. But um, we're going to be switching from instead of trying to count wolves individually, we're going to work on a model that has worked in many other wildlife species. It's, it's more cost effective. It's probably more accurate, and you get good confidence intervals. So what they do is they call, at the end of every year, you call up about 12,000 deer and elk hunters, and they ask them, well, did you see any wolves? Yes, no. How many did you see? Where were they? And you can build this model, and you can figure out how much of the state is actually wolf habitat. You take the average pack size, the average number of wolves per pack, figure out 600 square kilometers per pack, and you can kind of devise a model and have these wolves be worse than that. Well, they were figuring 600 square kilometers, they're not square miles, 200 square miles. Because as time goes on and we've got hundreds of wolves out there, you just can't count them anymore. And in a forested area like where we live, you never see them. So it makes it challenging. Down around Yellowstone area, it's more open terrain, they have a better uh, lot county. So here's kind of the, the pictorial um, representation of that model. I just explained what it is. So we're hoping to replace this minimum pounds in which we may or may not see wolves. I only had one flight last year. We would have the restrictions. This whole year, one flight. How many wolves did I see? About 12. So it's just not uh, practicable. The one thing I want to show is kind of the trend of what's happening with our wolves. And this is pretty important. So. This is a, I'll read you the chart here. Zero on this end, 700 on the top represents minimum counts of wolves. Here's 1979 where we have Kishnina, one wolf. This goes up to 215 and it drew an extra bar up to 2016. So it includes this year's count. But you see it just kind of puttered along, puttered along, and then it zoomed up. And basically the wolves peaked out around 2010 or 2011 by minimum count on how we count them. Oops, sorry. Going backwards. So as I said, you know, minimum count is really related to weather conditions, how much budget you have to fly, how much effort's put in. Perhaps a better way to look at how many wolves there are is to look at the amount of depredations. Because when you got wolves out there, a certain percentage of wolves are going to kill livestock. It's as simple as that. It's just going to happen. So what we have here, the purple lines are the number of complaints received in 1997 to 19, uh, 2016. A graph representing the number of depredations. But what I want you to look at is the pattern. Same thing. Here's 2009, 2010, 2011. You see the number of complaints received, the number of blues, the number of verified. It's the same curve. Creeps up and is tapering off. This is the number of cattle and sheep killed by wolves and the number of wolves removed. I know you're not supposed to put all these numbers so small, but I just want you to look at the trends. Here's 2009 and 10. It's the same. So very clearly, by several different measurements of indices, the wolf population has peaked. It's on its way up, slightly going down. 
And people have asked me, is that because of human harvest? Is it due to human pressure? Well, I don't know. Another theory is that we saw the same thing in Yellowstone Park when it was first came back. And there's no harvest in the park. So at some point, I think it's a combination of harvest pressure and wolves saturating the landscape. Part of what I want to do this winter is actually do some analysis on that. I don't have an answer. It's good food for thought, good discussion material. And this is the whole, the whole nine yards with the palm model added on top of everything else, and it's really confusing, but the blue is the palm model, and it's showing the same trend, and we've only done it up through 2014, but if they go to 15 and 16, you're gonna see the exact same thing. We're working on it. So where do these wolves survive? I say you've seen them, I say they're everywhere. When I first came out here from Minnesota, which had the only remaining population of the country, the wolves were strictly related to, uh, only found in the wilderness areas in northern Minnesota. And here, in Montana, well, we have a lot of wilderness and remote areas that are hard to access, and that's where I thought they would live, but they don't. They started there, in Glacier, and then they moved to the interface of private lands and federal lands, where ranchers are making a living, and then in the winter time, most importantly, the wolves absolutely are limited by the number of animals they have on the winter range that they can access for hunting. And in Montana, winter ranges are more or less limited to valley bottoms, which is, those are all elk, by the way, those are not cows. <laughs> That's down on a gardener. So there's a great winter range for wolves. Uh -oh. Fire extinguisher. <laughs> so the wolves show up on the winter range of the landscape and then we have some livestock challenges to face. Where else do they live? Well, they live in the Nine Mile. I've seen a great photograph of a radio collar wolf walking by the flathead of high school. Radio collar wolf, chain link fence from the dash cam of a police officer. Because somebody called in this wolf. It's a wild wolf. There's no doubt. This is about eight years ago. They will live anywhere that we would tolerate them. Let's put it that way. And the other place where they like to live, it's Yellowstone. How many of you have been to Yellowstone and watched wolves? I, I highly recommend, if you're interested and you want to see wolves, go to Yellowstone Park in the winter. You will see them at the in the weekend, absolutely. The surprising thing is how much money it has generated for the local businesses and industry around the park and up to Bozeman and so forth. It's a big deal. I think the models, we didn't even predict how much of an economic boom it would make but then again, you have an economic loss to the livestock growers. There's no doubt they have some hardships from having wolves on the landscape, too. Most importantly, wolves need only three things to survive. They need wild ungulates, ungulates being deer, elk, moose. They need large, undeveloped landscapes. Doesn't mean free of people, but just some place where they can have some refugia. And they need freedom of persecution from humans. And the last one is the most important. I've been over to um, Europe, they were helped start a wolf project in Romania and Italy, and they don't have the second one. They have large landscapes, but there are people on every square inch of the mountains grazing sheep and picking mushrooms, and there are people everywhere, but what they lack, they don't have people with poison straps and guns. So wolves are persisting in areas where the people are using them and they're almost strictly nocturnal. They've learned over centuries that if they're seen, you know, they're in trouble, but it's totally different than here. So some of the challenges we have are humans are moving into wolf habitat. This is a picture pretty famous in the Nine Mile area of a, a woman, a wealthy woman who bought the area where the Nine Mile wolves stand and have their rendezvous site because she loved wolves. And she built her children's swing set in the wolf rendezvous site in the sandbox in the player where the wolves raise their pups. And when her first dog was killed, she wasn't too worried about it, and then the wolves killed her second dog, and, and then the wolves came up and took the third dog off the porch, and, and she wasn't quite such a fan of wolves anymore. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, I'm just saying how much you may care for wolves or not like them, it's really how much they impact you personally. And it's a very personal story for those who suffer losses, and we have to address that. And wolves are moving into human habitat. I've seen them in most amazing places. We have wolves in West Glacier quite a bit, actually. We had a wolf kill a dog in West Glacier in May this year. 
Um, the, the dog owner called us, the game warden went out and picked up the wolf and it had the Department of Washington Fish and Game Air Tag in it. Oh. It came all the way from Washington to kill us, you know, try and kill a schnauzer in this glacier. <laughs> Died for it. But. The thing we found time and time again is that the vast majority of wolf mortalities are caused by humans. Um, down in Yellowstone, that's not true because it's free of humans inside the park bothering them, but they're the human, the, the biggest cause of mortality is wolves killing other wolves for trespassing. But here out there where we have wolves on the landscape with people, they harvest, they have illegal mortality, they have cars, they get hit by trains. They have a high reproductive rate. The good news is we originally had three separate subpopulations, Northwest Montana, Central Idaho, and Wyoming. They were pretty isolated from each other. But over the last 10 years, about 10 years ago, we started seeing them connecting by dispersal, and we could trace them through genetics as well, that they are indeed now functioning as one large metapopulation that's connected to Alberta and Canada, 12,000 wolves from you know, Alaska on down through the Rockies here. It's no longer separate. We don't have to worry about genetic isolation. Um, I think it's a pretty amazing, successful story. And the delisting of the wolves, yeah, I'm glad to have been a part of the process. So a little perspective, here is where wolves, historic range of wolves, prior to the 1900s. They lived everywhere except for a little thin strip in California. When I really became interested in wolves, 1970-ish, you'll see the only place wolves exist are the very northeastern corner of Minnesota and upper peninsula of Michigan, the Michigan wolves, winked out too. By the time I came out here in 1979, they only existed in Minnesota. And now, I can't keep up with maps at the distribution expansion of wolves. This is the most current one I have, and it's probably two years old. Now we have two packs in Northern California. We've got wolves that have showed up in Nevada. We've got wolves that have been in Colorado and Utah. They haven't established packs yet, but it's just a matter of time. They're the same threshold that we were at in 1979. And there's reintroduced populations in the Southwest and the, the red wolves over in the Tennessee area, which is a whole other story, which we don't have enough beer here to get into that. <laughs> but we, we are so blessed here because we enjoy an amazing ecosystem that is a full complement of all the predators and all the prey that were here prior to the arrival of Europeans with the exception of caribou. But everything else is still here. And I think with some tolerance and some good management, uh, um, we can keep them all here. Jim's going to talk about grizzly bears next month, right? I strongly encourage you all to come and learn about how the bears coexist or don't <laughs> in this area. And with the return of the wolf, we now have the last large predator to come back to our area. And the thing that's really key for wolves is they, they need both public land and private land to survive. Just protecting wilderness areas is not enough. They need to have private lands where people will tolerate them on that landscape. So with that, I just want to thank a couple of these people in DC Snow, very dear people. And I thank all these people and with some apologies to some of my wolves as well. <laughs> so. question just one little thing I started with wolves in Minnesota before I came out here and I was really fortunate to be mentored by Dave Meach starting in I caught an animal my first wild wolf in 1977 but of course I was very precocious I was only six years old so. <laughs> well, I think we, we owe another round of applause that was a great So I think what would work best is rather than passing the microphone around is that we, we have a, a repeat of the question at the front of the room here. And uh, please, fire away. She's ready. Um, let's, let's see what you got. You can't get away without doing a howl. Marilyn wants me to do a howl. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great start. Let's hear it. <laughs> So you have your map for Diane. <laughs> Feel free to join in. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yes. 
So the question was, the map showed that wolves were just west of the common divide. They didn't go east. Why not? Because when they go east, they get killed. They're too visible. And they are showing up along the Rocky Mountain front. We've had sightings of wolves along the Missouri. And I think they'll eventually establish some packs. That it's too open for them, and they encounter uh, challenges with humans. It's kind of like bears. They're quite parallel in that way. They would live there. They would tolerate them. You couldn't see it. John? Uh, the wolf population seemed to have peaked and are trending down a little bit. As I recall, the studies in Isle Royal kind of predicted that, that they would go through an oscillation and eventually come to a sort of an equilibrium. Uh, is that correct? And do you anticipate that that's what will happen here? So Don was saying, um, you noticing that our populations have gone up and peaked and tipped over, and they noticed he's read that about Isle Royal, and is that to be expected? I would say they're totally different situations because Isle Royal is genetically isolated and the reason they're crashing, they're down to two and they're not going to breathe <coughs> is because Isle Royal has no genetic input and so they've got to the point now where they're the same relatedness as siblings and they're not going to breathe. Here, I think it's a combination of wolves having saturated it's like any recovery, like if you put deer on an island, they go and then they tip over and then they hit some lower equilibrium. I think it's partly that, like in Yellowstone, like I explained, but I also think some impact of the harvest, which we have not yet analyzed, may also do that. The thing to keep in mind when I show you those population levels, we're still hundreds of wolves above what's federally mandated by the endangered species requirement. So when I show you the tip over, don't go, oh my God, the sky is falling. We've got a lot of wolves, but it's just a trend. And the state is managing wolves. There's no limit now. Anybody, everybody in this room, and your siblings and your brothers and whatever, could buy a wolf tag and you could easily harvest five. But they're so difficult to see and catch. It's really challenging. There's tens of thousands of licenses probably sold a year and to harvest 255 wolves. It, it's a challenge. Believe me, I know I've been traveling for 40 years and I spent all summer and it'll poof. It was difficult. <laughs> yes. When uh, Kishnea and her mate started, would the offspring, would their offspring have mated among themselves or uh, did they have to go seek other other mates? So the question question was when Kishnea mated and they had those seven pups, would they have mated amongst themselves or got other wolves? They would not have mated with their siblings. There is a constant flow once Kishnea made it. A little back step story here. So in southern Canada, southern BC and Alberta, when we were poisoning and trapping our wolves, they started seriously poisoning and killing wolves in the late 50s, about 1960-ish, because there was fear of rabies. And I don't know where they got that from, but they, basically it was wolfless south of Jasper National Park by the mid-60s, wolfless. So Kishnina had a calm from something like Jasper. So, but when she started, it was clear the pipeline had opened and wolves started pouring down. And we saw wolf after wolf coming down. We did the genetics. They were not that closely related. So we will not have sibling wolves breeding. Okay. Any question? Yeah. Can you address the uh, fact or fiction of uh, the wolf population affecting hunting in Montana? Sure. The question was, can I address the fact or fiction about wolves affecting hunting? So if you've driven the Swan Highway lately or 93 at night, you know how many dead white tails there are. So there are a lot of wolves and white tail. In certain instances, wolves can impact uh, an isolated game population and take it down and keep it there. Um, right now, in our ecosystem, we've got, we did studies with deer and elk and moose. There are mountain lions, grizzly bears, and wolves all preying on deer, elk, and moose, mule deer, and white tails. They all have a part of it. In terms of them wiping out game, that doesn't happen because if you get so few, few game out there, the wolves starve. They fail to reproduce, they absorb embryos. So. I, I guess a bigger question, a more specific question, is I've heard lots of reports about them disrupting elk herds and making elk hunting more difficult to stop the game of the wolves. Elk hunting is always difficult. <laughs> I don't want to kill two of my life. But um, it's frustrating for hunters who 
are want to get their elk and they feel they used to see more elk and now they're seeing wolf trucks and maybe they have taken the numbers down. I do know specifically the northern herd in northern Yellowstone, classic example. The wolves have been removed from the park, eradicated by about 1930. The gay population is built up so phenomenally. The northern herd was about 20,000 animals by about 1995. Bart O'Gear of the University of Montana, some other people were, were paid to go down there and gun and kill elk because they were eating themselves out of house and home. They were starving, they were dying by the hundreds or thousands. So, the wolves come back. We put back those two winters. We had the worst winter on record, though. It was the winter of 96, 97. And deer and whitetail, we lost 40% of our whitetail deer herd in northwestern Montana. And it wasn't due to wolves. It was due to snow. But the northern elk herd plummeted from 20,000 and just went ching, 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 ching. And now it's maintained itself. It's not very big, four or 5,000 animals, something like that. And that's where it's equilibrium is. And people go, oh my god, it's because of the wolves. It's like, well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. The winter is what killed his elk. And they've been overpopulated for a long time. Now they're searching from elk to bison, deer, they eat all everything. So that population is not likely to get back to 20,000 again. But in our mind, people think, you know, back when I got special elk permits to hunt the gardener hunt in 1994, I saw elk everywhere and I don't see any. It must be a wolf. It's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. Uh, at this time of year, would it be fair to add one more ungulate to your list? What's that? Reindeer. You must have reindeer. Actually, I wrote a I wrote a poem the other night before Christmas, back in the nineties, which was kind of about the wolves getting Santa's reindeer herd, and I did read an NPR one year. But anyway, the wolves end up pulling the sled, delivering all the toys. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't like it. <laughs> Happy story. <laughs> yeah. So if you're out hiking and you come across a wolf, what you guys do? question was, if you're out hiking and you come across a wolf, what's your best defense? First of all, if you have a dog with you, immediately get your dog under control. Wolves are going to be concerned about your dog. They're not going to be too concerned about you. So, if you get your dog under control, then I would make noise, run while you're there and holler at him. And if you're all scared, you can run at him. I mean, a wolf is going to leave. So, I, I had neighbors at the North Park, Dennis and Sue, who were taking care of a friend's border collie, and she walked out her driveway up near the Canadian border, and a wolf pack of seven wolves came out of the woods and ran at her. And when she told me the story, her voice was shaking and she had tears. She was so frightened. She had tears in her eyes. She was so angry at the wolves and kind of at me for having them come back. The dog, the, the dog came in, she picked it up in her arms, and the wolves circled around her and she kept saying, they could have killed me, they could have killed me. And I said, but you know what, you're here telling me the story and they could have killed me, you're seven years old. <laughs> and she kind of went, hmm. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but I would be much more concerned about a mountain lion. I'd be concerned about a black bear stalking me. Crazy bears. Jim can tell you about them, but wolves, if you encounter wolves, I personally like to be quiet and try and get pictures, but just holler. But your dog is a concern. Because they do kill dogs. Questions? Yeah. Is Canada still a source for wolves, or has it become the same with development and persecution? Good question. The question was, is Canada still a source for wolves, or has it become a sink? persecution. It has done both. And when our first wolves were first recovered in the 1980s, they had walked from Canada, and then they opened up wolf season in Canada in the late 80s. And in the early 90s, we became the main, main exporter to, to Canada, and we documented wolves at a Colorado Glacier going to Waterton, going up to Banff, going to the Kananaskis country, and becoming breeding animals. And now it's kind of equalized because they're killing kind of equally on both sides of the border. That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Following yeah. up on that question, we draw the 29th parallel, we see nothing above it, we see lots below it. Can you say anything about the difficulty of working with Canadian authorities in terms of the movement of wolves and the transplant of wolves? 
So the question was, with the 49th parallel, how does international borders affect working with Canadians, Americans in terms of the transplant and otherwise? So I can tell you when our rules are first coming back in the Flathill, Bob Reeve asked Ray DeMarchi out of Cranbrook, who was the Valley Manager for BC Ministry of Environment, could he, could he not have wolves for a little bit to help us out? Ray says, oh, sure, we got plenty. Shut the wolf season. Mm -hmm. Just unilaterally, one guy. I mean, it was a small bureaucracy compared to what we do. And then when he got more wolves, he opened it up again. And in terms of the transplants, when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service talked to the Canadians, some were taken out of the Hudson Yards and some were taken out of the Alberta, D.C. And they said, can we come up and remove some wolves? He said, how many do you want and how fast can you pick them up? <laughs> <laughs> you take all you want. They were very helpful. They helped us with the captures. Um, and I find the hardest thing that I have is coming if I'm doing wolf work, is coming back in the United States and being questioned by customs. I don't have any problems going into Canada. <laughs> so, no, Canadian has been very good to work with. Yeah. Diane, you indicated that the ones that came down naturally seemed to be more adaptable and understood how to work in Canada and all that stuff. The ones that were reintroduced could have been bad boys. Do you see any difference in the genetics of those that came down naturally and those that were reintroduced? let's say aggressiveness or mm -hmm. ability to survive, something like that? Good question. The question that, that's a great question. Yeah. The question was the wolves as they were tiptoed down and were shy versus the wolves that were reintroduced, were they more aggressive, were they genetically different? They are not genetically different at all. We've done the analysis. They're all similar. They have the same um, heterogeneity. But what is different is the wolves that walk down, I'm not saying they were they weren't necessarily trying to bite humans, but the ones that didn't, didn't survive to reproduce. So you end up selecting for shy animals. The ones that have been in the park, those animals were taken from the same populations where they were trapped and shot and poisoned. And they had the, the luxury of being able to raise their families and not be afraid of people anymore. And they pass that on so you can drive down Yellowstone and scan around the road and walk by your car and just about put on your tires. And it's not because they're a different wolf, it's because they're so a product of their environment, they adapt to anything, and they adapt to being around people. And as soon as they leave the park, they're killed. They have a very hard time keeping the wolves alive, and the connectivity from Yellowstone to central Idaho and northwest Montana is just, is just enough. Because they have this big ring of open country around Yellowstone to make it through. But up between Idaho and Montana, they're going back and forth like the Amtrak. I mean, there's no problem there in the woods. So the are, so the interbreeding is actually because of the ones that are coming north to south because they can make it into Yellowstone as opposed to the woods from Yellowstone going north? The question was dispersing two-way street. It's actually two ways. It just they have a harder time they have the same challenge when they come from the north to go down there because they have to get through the ranch line. So it's the same it's the same issue. But they are making enough to take make it. I mean if a wolf can show up in Nevada <laughs> In California, they, they're pretty good at, at making it. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, there have been reports of wolves in Colorado, and I'm thinking they probably won't make it there because of the youth population and the accessibility. Is that a good assessment? So the comment was um, there have been wolves re reports in Colorado, and are they going to have trouble making it because of the huge population and accessibility? There's a lot of accessibility around the Nine Mile, and the wolves are there. I just think it's a matter of having people be a little tolerant of them. And they're not going to live in Denver and Boulder. Well, they might live in Boulder. They might live in Boulder. Not a deer, but yeah. 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 But um, the one thing is that, you know, this is just a little sidetrack, but the Mexican, wolf, Mexican wolves that have been introduced are very inbred. The founding population was seven. They're very heavily and intensively managing the genetics of these wolves and constantly going out and pulling pups out of the wild and just replacing the fostered animals born in captivity with the right genetics. Oh, it's just, it's very hard for these wolves to make it. They're constantly being manipulated by people. They're having a hard time trying to be wild wolves. And so we were talking about that. There's a big investment in this program genetically. And my thought is, 
I think that wolves, when they come from Yellowstone and they make it to Colorado, and one of the next thing that comes up and makes it to Colorado, and they fight each other, we will solve the genetic problem naturally. And you know, there's people who fight that, but in terms of wolves, wolves are wolves. And a hundred years ago, the Mexican wolf population was connected to the Canadian wolf population. There were wolves the whole length of the spine of the continent. And someday it'll get there again. People don't want to hear some places too. I know that. Yes. So, uh, I spent um, five years in the early 70s in the Indigenous Commission. And um, probably 30 or 40 days out on the world. Mm -hmm. and it's sad to hear that the balance between the moose and the wolves on our royal is falling apart. What's going to happen to the moose population that can't control on our royal by the wolves? He commented he lived in the UP, Michigan, Isle Royal for years in the 70s in this wonderful natural experiment of two wolves that they migrated from the mainland across the frozen ice of Lake Superior, landing in Isle Royal and establishing a founding population. It's a very amazing fairy tale because it's just moose and wolves, a few fox, a few beaver, but it's a very simple ecosystem. It's been really studied for a long time, pretty neat stuff. But now the wolves are crashing, so he says, what's going to happen to the moose? Well, the biggest predator of moose in Isle Royale is a little winter chick about a quarter of the size of a little fingernail. Killing moose by the droves. Killing them. They have no hair. They can't regulate. They freeze to death. They starve. You said wolves, you meant moose. Moose, I'm sorry. Yeah. The winter chick on the moose. Sorry, not the wolves. So when wolves go away, Moose are going to be in trouble. They eat themselves on house and home. The population's going to crash. And then, sometime down in the future, two more wolves are going to come across the ice and exterior. We only have such a short window. But this has been going on for thousands of years. It's a very natural process. Well, you've got both had questions. Somebody else who hasn't had a question? Yeah. Given the trends of the wolf population right now, and the rise and fall, the cultural acceptance of wolves in Montana right now. What do you, what do you think about the future of wolves in Montana and, and how we will continue to manage them? The question was, given more cultural acceptance in Montana, what's the future of wolves in Montana? Oh boy. You know, 40 years ago, I never would have thought we'd been standing here talking about 2,000 wolves in you know, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana. I think wolves will keep trying to expand out they're going to be rebuffed in some areas, they'll be allowed in others. They will live wherever we'll tolerate them. They'd live out at Scobie if they had some place to hide. <laughs> it's, it'd be fun with following the bear work and see what happens. But the only thing, I mean, there was the pendulum was to kill all the wolves not that long ago, and now it's, then it went to protect all the wolves, like in the 70s, and now it's kind of in the middle, which is a much better place to be. That's where the wolves have to live. Go ahead. Uh, I just read in the magazine that the deer population in Minnesota jumped 22% and the wolf population went up as well. Yes. So is the population is a function of food too, isn't it? Yes. So the comment was you just read that in Minnesota the white tail population increased 22% and wolves increased. So it's, it's, it's milder winters, deer are doing better, um, maybe there's more agriculture, there's going to be a mix, and they're just going to track each other. There's a little lag, but they'll be tracking each other. But here, Montana, isn't there, I mean, you have to stop somewhere because there's got to be a balance between food and animals, right? So the question was, in Montana, it has to stop somewhere because of the balance. Yeah, we have. We've stopped. I mean, it's going down. And deer and elk and moose populations. I mean, we're never going to have 10 million white-tailed deer in Montana. I mean, we're, we're kind of full of all our relics, and they, they coexist sometimes. When, so for wolves, a really terribly hard winter with crusted snow and deep snow and long cold is like going to Hawaii. I mean, wolves, the worst the winter is, the fatter and happier they are because the prey can't give away in their suffering. So when we have really hard winters, wolves do really well. They produce a lot of pups, but the next winter, there's not much to eat, and the wolves just go. 
so there's two of them. Yeah. Nature takes care of it. <laughs> Anybody over here? Yeah. Go. You are over here? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the question was, is there any other states, the United States, where we expect to have wolf reintroductions? And I would say, <coughs> no. We have this really amazing little window opportunity with Bill Clinton and Bruce Babbitt and Molly Davey all in office at the same time that window opened about this far, and those wolves flew through that window. That one is gone because wolves will get there. They'll get there. And the introductions they've done that they have up here in terms of red wolf, the Mexican wolf, they're so fraught with problems. And I think those states that want wolves, I, I can't imagine people in Florida wanting wolves. I can't imagine people, although wolves have gotten on We had a wolf get to Kentucky from Michigan. It was tagged. I mean, They'll get there, but there's a lot of places wolves just aren't going to live anymore. I don't, I don't think wolves are going to live in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, they might get there, but they aren't going to stay there very long. So uh, it's sort of a place where it's. So I'm from Alaska, and I'm from Alaska, and there's a, there was a recently last winter there was a human killed by a wolf, a teacher jogging, and it was purely a predatory response to her jogging. Um, what are your feelings on the human reaction to that sort of event? Because I mean, half of the pack was killed. And like it's probably not necessary. This is a, a very controversial issue. You asked me the question about wolves. So I can tell you when people were first having wolves come back, the wolf proponents were going around giving talks saying there's never been a case of a wolf attacking a person in North America. Like, oh, okay. There's never been a case of a healthy wolf attacking a person. Oh, there's never been a case of a healthy wolf on a Wednesday attacking you. <laughs> because if you go through the literature, it has happened in very rare. I know the jogger, the lady jogger in Alaska, there was a fellow up in northern Saskatchewan who was near a logging camp where the wolves were food habituated. It's the same situation with food conditioned bears. I can think of off the, off the top of my hand, like those are two, and there's a couple of people who survived bite by a wolf. And all of them, maybe with the exception of the woman, I'm not sure, but they were food conditioned wolves. And I don't know about the ladies, but they went in and killed the wolves. Okay, so we say in the last 100 years, there's three or four incidents. You know how many people get killed every year by vending machines falling on them? <laughs> Literally, it's a lot. So, I think people can select what they want to believe. And I would just say the smart thing is, if you live in a wolf country, if you see wolf, you don't, are uncomfortable, you yell at <coughs> those stuff, make yourself big and angry. What about bear spray? Bear spray would be a great tool. I think bear spray is a great tool for anything, <laughs> including obnoxious, <laughs> charging <laughs> chihuahuas when you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've ever done it. <laughs> I can't, I can't think of a better spot to, to call it quits. Um, so uh, we were really lucky. I think next month we're going to hear about bears. Very little, little different spin, uh, but. Um, I encourage you to come next month, and we're working on the schedule after that. Uh, it looks good. We hope to have a talk on fire ecology in the spring, um, fire management, and, and how fire, which is pretty pertinent to us, uh, um, in, in, oh, there, oh, okay. He just volunteered. Volunteered, there you go. He's hiding, I like that. Duck over. Anyway, what a, what a great talk. Thank you again. Wonderful job. Thank you. Um,
Two years. Here we are. Cheers. Yeah.